Welcome to the Paranormal Stakeout Radio TV show with Larry Lawson. As a former career law enforcement officer and law enforcement educator, Larry focuses on the use of tried and true law enforcement investigative techniques in conducting paranormal investigations. Despite his experience and training, Larry also and keeps an open mind to discussions on topics that deal with evidence that are not quite as physical in nature. Paranormal stakeout guests are professionals in the field of the paranormal and parapsychology, conducting the investigations and research needed to further the cause of paranormal study. Larry advocates an agenda of standardization of structure and training in the field of paranormal investigation and research for the purpose of one day being able to produce the evidence needed to convince a jury of the existence of the paranormal. Whether it is ghosts, UFOs, unsolved mysteries, hauntings or cryptids, no topic is beyond the investigative reach of Larry Lawson and the Paranormal Stakeout Radio TV show team. Now, here is the host of the Paranormal Stakeout Radio TV show, Larry Lawson. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, my name is Larry Lawson. I'm the host of this show coming to you from Vero Beach, Florida, the home uh, home office of the Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation and Indian River Hauntings. Uh, if you're ever interested in checking us out a little bit, you can uh, go to our website at IndianRiverHauntings.com. You can also check us out on Facebook at uh, Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation and Indian River Hauntings and our YouTube channel at Indian River Hauntings 2341 if you want to see what else that we're up to out there. Uh, but really glad to have everybody back tonight. You know, we cover all kinds of uh, subjects here in Paranormal Stakeout. It's not just ghosts, but it's anything outside the norms of science. And tonight, um, bringing to you a compelling, in, very interesting and compelling story. Um, my guest is Pat O'Connell. She is a communications consultant for many high-tech uh, uh, corporations. And as it, it, in varied fields such as nuclear power, aerospace, uh, antibody li library solutions. She's a researcher, a novelist, an author. She's involved in all kinds of things, and she's also a paranormal investigator. Uh, and I am really, really uh, happy to have with us tonight Pat O'Connell. So, Pat, welcome to Paranormal Stakeout. Thanks, Larry. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, it's you, you've got such an interesting story. Uh, and, and I'd like to get into that. But before we do that, I'd like my audience to learn a little bit about who Pat O'Connell is. And in and, uh, in addition, your brother. I want to hear a little bit about Jimmy. So share with us, if you would. Well, um, you know, <laughs> uh, you think I'm more special than I think I am. But, um, you know, I'm, I've been a writer and a communications consultant for over 30 years doing marketing and training. And, uh, you know, all kinds of technical things and um, websites and uh, even process development, helping people. It used to be called uh, 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 efficiency experts, you know, oh, okay. ma making, making your, untangling your systems and, and making them work more efficiently. My daughter is now doing basically the same thing as what you call a scrum master now uh, oh. in software. So, uh, you know, kind of pass that down a little bit, but, um, you know, and I, I, uh, I'm a skeptic, I'm a skeptic, but I am the good kind of skeptic. I am open to, uh, evidence and I'm not a pushover, but I am open-minded to all kinds of possibilities. And I'm fascinated with the idea, you know, you're, you're researching ghosts. I've done ghost hunts, but then, you know, the skeptic in me debunks some of the things that I, so the evidence, the evidence that I allegedly collected. And, you need to follow the evidence, don't we? Right. But the whole point of doing that to me is to get rid of the garbage so that the real mysteries pop out in great relief. So I'm looking for the real mysteries. And I that's why I love this story that Jim got me involved in. 
And how did, how did you get involved in the paranormal? What what got you oh besides your brother than Jim? <laughs> any any past experiences? We we grew up with parents that were open to all kinds of things. I mean, we used to watch. Uh, it was a Darren McGavin show, a, a TV Night series. Night Stalker. Night Stalker, right. It was yeah. so campy and goofy, but we loved it. And, you know, in the uh, the great, the first great Northeast blackout in 1965, um, we were living in a house that was 270 years old. And so, I mean, it had a lot of history from from the early days. It was an old inn on the Boston Post Road and the Marquis de Lafayette, and Benjamin Franklin had been at our house. So, um, you know, we had, there was all kinds of history there. And so everybody kind of gathered at our house. We had this big, we had actually several giant fireplaces. And so we had a big fire going in the den and we were listening to transistor radio. And one of our friends, one of uh, my brothers and my friends from high school uh, came in as all of the kids in the neighborhood did. Uh, they just came in like it was their house. And he said he had seen a UFO that night. And I had forgotten about that till Jimmy mentioned it. And that reminded Jimmy that he had, an, and my brother was an experiencer. He was an abductee. And J so Jimmy's your brother. Jimmy's, Jimmy's your brother. my, he was my oh. youngest brother. And okay. so talking about this, uh, you know, remembering the blackout he re and remembering that our friend had seen a UFO made him start thinking about the fact that he might have had his first uh, encounter, his first abduction, um, not that year, but maybe a couple of years later when he was still a kid, um, because he just kind of disappeared from, my mother had sent him over to the store, it was like two houses away, and he didn't come back for hours and hours, and he didn't know where, he, where he'd been. Well well, let's so, let's back um, up just let's back up just a little bit. You you had a, kids were over at your house. One of the friends said they saw a UFO. How did that involve Jimmy? How did right. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, it did. It, sure. it, when Jimmy and I were talking about the blackout, we were recalling the blackout and how much fun we I had that night. And he okay. said, "Do you remember uh, when Pete said on the way over he had seen a UFO in about the same place that my brother, actually my two youngest brothers, had seen their first UFOs over the store, over the grocery store. So gotcha. that just kind of, Jimmy had come, for years and years, he thought he was just having these really vivid dreams until one day somebody said, um, have you ever thought that they might be dreams? So he was dreaming about you know having these abduction kind of dreams, but he never allowed himself to consider that they were real until this friend had mentioned it. And when he started looking at it from that perspective, he found out that his wife was also having experiences on the same nights he was having these abduction dreams or these abduction experiences. And, you know, she would, she smelled a certain smell that uh, actually Jimmy was, Jimmy got on, on the phone with Whitley Strieber uh, in 1991, the year of the big uh, uh, solar eclipse, that there were all the m multiple sightings over Mexico City. I don't know if you remember that, uh, or maybe yeah. I'm <laughs> maybe you're too young for that. But uh, he, there was this uh, t TV show, and you could call in, and Whitley happened to be a guest on it. And Whitley, I'm sure your audience knows, is one of the uh, probably the most famous abductee the author of the communion books and all that. Mm -hmm. And so Jimmy called in and was talking about his wife having this experience uh, and Whitley confirmed it, but he was a little uncomfortable because it was one of those things that it's like, and, and you being a former law enforcement officer, sometimes you withhold pieces of evidence because only the perpetrator will know or only somebody on the inside will know. And Jimmy asked Whitley a question on this TV show and Whitley was kind of uncomfortable about it. And he said, yeah, uh, we don't talk about that. <laughs> and it was nothing big, but it was just something to confirm that other families are having that same experience where the partner who's not being abducted experiences other things. I mean, one morning my sister-in-law uh, was making the bed and the bed was full of leaves and you know, she's like, okay, I don't know how this happens, but, uh -huh. you know. 
Okay, so uh, he's had these experiences. He he spoke with Whit Whitley Strieber. What okay. happened after that? Well, um, you know, after that, I think I think he started seriously um, accepting the the reality of the abduction, and then he realized that there were millions of other people who had the same experience and didn't have any uh, acknowledgement, didn't have any respect that, you know, it tore their lives apart in some cases. So he started um, talking to people and, you know, he connected with them uh, all over the world on Facebook and other social media. And so that's when he decided he wanted to create a TV show, a reality show that would tell these people's story. And he said he, he would get really frustrated because he said, everybody wants to know how is this different from other UFO stories? And he said, it's not about the vehicles. If somebody famous showed up at your door, you're not going to say, oh, hi, it's nice to see you. What? Let me go look at your car. You know, so um, he wanted to do a show that told the abductees stories and gave them uh, credibility and compassion. And so what, he what was, year was this? What year uh, was this? Oh gosh, he started doing that. I don't know, probably 2010 or earlier than that. I mean, 20, 2005, it, it could have been earlier than that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember exactly when he started very seriously um, developing the story and seeking funding from investors and learning all about, you know, the, the media business, which is a big mess of politics and drama. And, uh, you know, he went through several false starts with investors who then sabotaged the thing or wanted it to be something else. And I'm sure anybody who's ever done this has experienced uh, those kinds of, of issues. Okay. So he's, and, and from my, from what I understand too, he began to, he attended a couple of conferences and started seeing people that he had actually seen during his uh, abduction dreams for lack of a better word. Yes. And uh, he, he saw, he, like he talked to one woman that uh, was describing an event where she was abducted. She saw a man in, in the ship. Uh, another human in the ship where she was, uh, had been abducted and was being, uh, you know, in, you know, tested or whatever they were doing to her. And, you know, he had only spoken to her on the phone and they were both supposed to go to a UFO conference. And he did, he, he went to all these conferences. And when he ran into her, she, he didn't recognize her, but she recognized him. She said, it's you. You're the guy that was in the ship when I was abducted. So she, yeah. So, so that yeah. was really interesting. Well, well, we're about ready to come up on our next break and we've heard a lot about your brother, Jimmy, but Jimmy actually turned you on to a story that you began to research and get involved in with yourself. And that's a, a guy by the name of uh, Clay, Clay Wheeler, Clay I Wheeler. Believe, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. um, what did Jimmy just called you one day and said, Hey, you've got to check this out. Right. He called me, it was in 20, early 2015. And he said, you know, I've got, uh, I've got this case and it's in Texas. Now Jimmy was in Connecticut uh, and I'm here in Texas. And he said, this guy's story is so much bigger than I can do in a one hour TV show or even a multiple episode arc. Uh, and would you be interested in first, checking him out, you know, meeting with him and vetting him, make sure he's not, oh. you know, out there crazy. Well, we got to take our first break now. So when we get back, let's start talking about Clay Wheeler. So stay with okay. us, folks. More to come on Paranormal Stakeout. We'll be back after these messages. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, on the X-Zone Radio Show, as together we will investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. 
Join me and my special guests from around the world each and every night as we investigate UFOs, ghosts, psychics, Bigfoot conspiracies, and much, much more. Dare to believe and dare to be heard on the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, Monday through Friday at 11 p.m. on your hometown radio, Classic 1220, Classic 1220.ca. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. And we are back with my guest, author and researcher, Pat O'Connell. And uh, going to get into this kind of an interesting story here. Now, to, just to rehash a little bit, your brother, uh, Jim, um, who's no longer with us, I understand, um, began began to uh, work with folks that were abductees, even started a, a show to get, allow them to, to uh, spread their story or at least share their story. And he came across this guy that he contacted you about being an author. And his name is Clay Wheeler. And the story was bigger than he could tell. So with that, uh, tell us more. Well, that's right. And he said... Uh, Basically, this this guy has had all kinds of experiences, not just UFOs and aliens, but a lot more. And your audience is probably most similar, most familiar with Skinwalker Ranch. So there was, you know, a mix of UFOs and aliens and uh, ghosts and pol poltergeist and orbs and interdimensional portals and you name it. So this actually goes back to more like the original uh, Skinwalker story, not the one that we're seeing on TV with all the technology. Uh, and mm -hmm. so that's what happened. And he said, um, he said, so would you be interested in vetting this guy? Make sure before I come down to Texas to film him and, you know, see what's going on. Um, would you check him out? And if you think he's the real deal, would you be interested in writing a book or multiple books or a screenplay or all of the above? And I'm like, sure, that sounds really interesting. And then he said, the guy says, claims that he has shot and buried an alien out there. And I'm like, my eyes bugged out and I'm like, okay, I'm in. So, um, yes. you know, it, it turns out, you know, this guy is a, uh, was a, uh, an aircraft repair technician. He had his own business in this little bitty airport in the middle of nowhere. I mean, complete rural country, uh, no, nobody around. I mean, it's not like any airport you've ever imagined. It's just basically a landing strip and a couple of buildings. Which, which, which state was this in? This is in Texas. In Texas. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, this guy, uh, you know, he, he owned a hangar, but the hangar had um, an apartment. He had built an apartment on the other end of the hangar building. And in the middle, there was his office. So all of this uh, stuff happened uh, at or around the airport. And he was seeing UFOs. He was seeing aliens. Um, he saw, uh, he, he had guys events where he lost his keys and show they showed up in the ceiling in the rafters of the hangar now you know what a hangar looks like it's like 30 feet up and um how do you get how do you lose your keys up there 
Um, now, another, was he, other was of he his telling, employees. Was he telling, was he telling you this story or was this coming from Jimmy right now? No, this was, well, uh, Jimmy kind of gave me this, the snapshot of the breadth of the craziness. And then I got in touch with Clay and I started yeah. learning all about uh, what had gone on. And he was just like a pinball machine at first. Uh, just so happy to have somebody listen to him uh, that didn't dismiss him and say, you're crazy, uh, who really wanted to know. And, and I wanted, you know, you and I were talking about, um, I'm a skeptic, but I'm open-minded. And so when I investigate something, I'm trying to sort the wheat from the chaff in a way, I want to get the garbage out of the way so that I can really focus on true mysteries and try to understand them. So that's what I wanted to do with him. And he had a lot of stories. There were some things that he experienced. Um, you know, he had pictures of rods, what people call rods or, or skyfish. And I, I'm sure you've heard of that. And mm -hmm. it's really a misunderstanding. It's a, you know, your camera shutter speed is too slow to freeze the movement of, of the wings of bugs, like a moth or something in the dark. And so it looks like a flying worm with a bunch of wings. And so, you know, I wanted to debunk some of these things with him so that when people heard his story, they were going to believe what he saw and what he describes to them. Um, that they can't, they're not going to just dismiss some of this stuff as, you know, misinterpretations or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, we went through, when I started working with him, we corresponded, we talked on the phone and he sent me a whole bunch of pictures. Now, when Jimmy first told me about this, he said, you know, this guy has all this evidence. Well, I was, you know, salivating to see this evidence. Well, it turns out that a lot of his photos were blurry or it was a dot in the sky and you couldn't really tell what it was. And then the things that he saw up close, he didn't get a chance to take a picture of, or he tried to take a picture and it was dark. So, so all he got was dark on dark. And so, um, you know, a lot of the evidence I had to end up disregarding because I ultimately believed he experienced some of some some really extraordinary things. So at, at a certain point, I started telling him, forget about your pictures, forget about well, there were a few things that were that are interesting. Uh, but for the most part, just tell me what you experienced with your own eyes, not through a camera, not through a scope, not through, uh, you know, uh, whatever night vision goggles or whatever let me ask you this real quick you weren't happy with the evidence and i understand it this is in texas and i and i understand your uh, concern about it, letting the exact spot out so i won't i won't ask you about that so much but what about him then made you believe him with the lack of evidence what about him caused you to think he was real there were a lot of things and really kind of the last chapter of the book, I go through trying kind of my, my skeptics logic. Could it have, could it have been hallucinations? Could it have been this? Could it have been that? But there's always a, but I couldn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't explain it all away. And really when it came down to it, if you would look at him when he was talking about his experiences. And I, I, I have one clip from an interview where he's, he's sitting in a lawn chair with the runway behind him. And I ask him overall, was this a negative or a positive experience? And he said, well, yeah, I'd, ha I'd have to, I'd have to say it was a negative experience because he, he had gotten sicker and sicker and sicker throughout the mm -hmm. course of this experience. And, you know, I can kind of explain some of that. Um, but he, um, you know, he, he said, I guess overall it was a negative experience, but immediately his whole manner changed and he just kind of looked up and he said, but you know, it was, it was exhilarating. You, you, it was like living in the sci-fi channel every night, looking up at the sky and seeing these ships. And so you could tell that he, it just, he believed it. 
so deeply that I believed it. I believed him. And as much as I tried to dismiss some of the some of the the things that he claimed that happened or that he saw, there was always a piece that I couldn't explain away. So for me, this is still an open case. I mean, I, I feel like there's so much, I mean, we've got, uh, we've got a team and we can talk about that later, but um, we want to go out there and for example, test for um, toxic gases, or is there something in the water that could have poisoned people in that area? Because people were experienced, not just him, people who worked at his shop, his wife, okay. people who lived in the area were having strange experiences. They were also seeing craft. So um, it wasn't just him, but the skeptic in me wants to think, is there a prosaic explanation? What, what, was there some kind of toxin in the water? And that's an excellent direction to go in. But what did he see? You, you've talked about seeing things, but what right. did he see? Well, he saw all kinds of UFOs from the, I think the first one he saw was like a pork pie hat. It was silver, uh, kind of like a pie plate. Uh, he, he saw classic, he, he called the Mexican hat saucers. He saw uh, a, a, an orb that he said was like a soap bubble, a giant soap bubble. Uh, and there was this one craft, and he he drew some sketches of the various craft that he had seen. Uh, there were egg-shaped craft. Um, there were some that looked like what Kenneth Arnold drew. The the Kenneth Arnold, who, the pilot who first, he didn't really coin the term flying saucers, but he, he said what he saw of these ships over Mount Rainier, I think. Um, he said they, they moved like saucers skipping on water. But when he drew them, they didn't look like our classic flying saucers. They were like a disc with a something on the back. So Clay saw those. And then there was this other craft. He said it looked like a hard shell eyeglass case. And that one showed up on a couple of occasions. The first time it gave him, he called it the headache beam. He said it felt like a bucket of warm water was poured into him. And then after that, he got this horrible headache. And, uh, you know, but he his friends were concerned that they were trying to kill him. He thought they were trying to communicate with him. He said, it's, he said, I think it's like what a computer must feel like when it's downloading data. And I thought that is such a cool concept that he would, you know, per, humanize. Explain the it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Explain it that way. How many people, you said other people there saw it, saw these events. Right if you could, and they were employees of his people that worked at the airport, was, was it a very, was there a very, I know you've said it's out in the middle of nowhere, but was there a town near there? Yeah, uh, there's a small town, very small town. How many, there. how many people do you, how many people did, have you been able to identify that experienced things? If you could put a, a general number on it. Out there? Yeah. Um. Well, his, his mom, Clay, his mom, I have not, tracked down his wife, his ex-wife yet. Uh, we talked to a friend of his who, who was involved in some of these things and did see some of the stuff. Now he thought, and we can talk about this, he thought it was demonic, not aliens. And it, he, he thought was, all of it was a manifestation of demonic forces. Oh, uh, that's so, something I'd like to, I would like to, to delve in there. Now, we're getting ready to take our next break, but just to kind of set up our, our what we want, I want to talk about this next session is, was he ever abducted? Did he ever see aliens? What was his experiences with those aliens? Um, also, how did everybody come together? Uh, your brother, Clay, and, and not only your brother's not with us, I understand Clay has also passed on also. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to chat about all of that when we come back after this break. So, folks, lots of things to talk about. Clay Wheeler and uh, his UFO abduction experiences. So stay with us. We'll be back right after these messages.
Are you ready to dive into the mysteries of the unknown? Tune into the electrifying X Zone Radio TV show hosted by the one and only Rob McConnell. I'm Rob McConnell, and get ready for a mind bending journey through the unexplained phenomenon that surrounds us all. From UFO encounters to cryptids, ghosts, and everything in between, we've got it covered here in the X Zone. Rob McConnell, the seasoned investigator and renowned radio personality, brings you the most compelling interviews with top experts, authors, and experiences from around the world. Each episode is an unforgettable exploration into the depths of the extraordinary. That's right, Exo Nation. Join me every week as we open the door to the supernatural and explore the strange and amazing stories that will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. And it's not just radio anymore. With our groundbreaking TV show, you can now witness the sessions unfold right before your eyes. From chilling reenactments to captivating visuals, prepare yourself for a multimedia experience like never before. With a legacy spanning over two decades, the X Zone Radio and TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, is your ultimate source for mind blowing entertainment and thought provoking discussions. Join our growing community of truth seekers as we continue to unlock the world's mysteries. So, why wait? Step into the X Zone and embark on a journey that will challenge your beliefs, ignite your curiosity, and keep you on the edge of your seat. Remember, Exxon Nation, the truth is out there, and it's waiting for you right here on the Exxon Radio and TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell. Don't miss a minute of the action. Tune in now on your favorite radio station or visit TV.com to join the adventure. The Exxon Radio TV show with Rob McConnell, where reality meets the unknown. The Exazone Radio TV show, unraveling the secrets of the universe, one episode at a time. For more information visit www.exazoneradiotv.com. Welcome back, everybody, with my guest tonight, Pat O'Connell, uh, sharing with us a very fascinating story. So we, your brother, who, who has experiences, gets a hold of you, asks you to check out this guy, Clay Walker, that ha- had an experience that he'd like to feature on the uh, uh, production that he's doing for television. You go out there, you interview him, you start getting some information. I, I've got to tell you, I, I'm impressed with the fact that you want to get out there, test the soil, test water, find logical answers for this. because some fascinating stories and i don't doubt that you believe them but right now we don't have any evidence right. but now he started to also talking to you about actually seeing aliens possibly being abducted so pick it up there and, and share with us what happened what he saw what he experienced right well um just to back up a little bit there were these behavior changes and this is how oh. the demonic forces or this demonic concept came in and it seemed like everybody who would, uh, he said it, his employees, when they clock in at the at the airport, they would, uh, their personality would go dark. And the one who was most affected apparently by it was his wife. And there were several occasions where uh, her personality completely went dark to the point where he felt that she was, uh, she, she was a victim of some kind of demonic possession. So the, the first occasion was they had had a fight and um, he went out to, to, to her truck. She was leaving and she slammed his hand in the door and then dragged him from the truck for like a mile and a half. And he ended up with uh, broken ribs and two broken arms and a broken leg and, you know, oh. abrasions okay. and ended up in the hospital anyway. Uh, And then another time she woke up, she looked like she was eight months pregnant. And he, first of all, was scared to death for her because what can cause a bump on your belly this big? What kind of, you know, could it, she had been bitten by something or whatever. And he wanted to get her to the hospital. Uh, But she, she was eating raw meat out of the refrigerator. And he said her voice got really deep uh, and, that day that she woke up looking pregnant, um, he tried to get her to try to convince her to go to the hospital and she wouldn't go and ended up kicking him in the head. Not, he fell down, hit his head and he was knocked out 
for for a while when he but when he came to she was gone mm-hmm. and when she came back several hours later it was gone so that was the second thing and then the third thing was that she he had said you need to go move in, go stay with your sister because this place is affecting you. This is not good for you. It's not good for anybody. And so she showed, so she was gone staying with her sister, but she showed up at the airport one day and started with a 38, a a 38 special gun Mm -hmm. and started shooting everybody. And fortunately she didn't hit anybody, but she ended up being arrested and uh after that he got divorced so now to answer to to answer your question now he's living there by himself and that's when he started seeing aliens the first time happened it was the middle of the night he woke up it was three o'clock in the morning and he couldn't sleep and he thought well i'll just call my sister because she was working in china at the time so it's the middle of the day for her so he calls and he's chatting with her and he's just kind of pacing around the, the living room and just fidgeting and he goes and he reaches for the door that goes from his apartment into the office that's between the apartment and the hangar. And he opens the door and on his left, there are two little gray aliens. And he said, all of this happened in a few seconds, but it just etched in his mind. He said, he opened the door and he said, these two aliens moved out of the way as if they were like a gate on a hinge. You know, and he he thought that was that was really weird. So that to me was one of those weird things that who would make that up? You know, if you're if you're lying mm-hmm. or you're hallucinating, where do you get that? So and, and then so he 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 looked at the alien, the two little aliens, and then then he looks over to his right, and there's this tall alien who was tan skin, and he said he was naked, but he had no features. So it was like a Ken doll. It was a blank slate. The eyes were huge. The lids, top and bottom, had bulges in the back of the head. And he said, and this thing lunged toward him. And he said he knew right away this was the bodyguard for the two little guys. And when this thing lunged toward him, he freaked out, backed out, closed the door, and dropped the phone. Well, I found out later his sister said, he actually said, got to go. <laughs> And I don't know whether he, he he canceled the call, you know, ended the call or she did, but whatever it was. Uh, so that was his first encounter with aliens. Did he did he say anything over the phone to his sister? Did he snap a picture with the, the cell phone? Do we have any? No. Nothing. And, and no, see, that's, and, the, that's and, the problem both you have with the UFO side as right. well as I do with the ghost side. We don't have those pictures when we have the stories and it makes it very tough to prove it. Well, and this was in 2010. He was not the most uh, technically leading edge guy. I mean, he, he, he could do anything with gears and machines, but not so much with computers. So he had just a little old flip flip phone. So, you know, in those days, the, the screen was like the size of a postage stamp and he, you know, he wouldn't even have thought of it at the time anyway. So, um, so that was his first encounter with, with aliens. And then there were other, there were other creatures may or may not have been aliens. We don't know. Uh, there was an interdimensional portal portal, which is similar to the, the, uh, what the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, story. Uh, and that's, that's a whole other thing. Um, but then he, he started seeing these little gray aliens in the hangar. And the first one that he saw, uh, he and his secretary were in the in the hangar late one night. Everybody else was gone. And they thought it was a kid in the hangar. And so they're trying to find the kid because this is the middle of nowhere. If there's a child who's in this hangar and there's no adults looking for him, this is a serious problem. So uh, when he finally realized that um, it was it was an alien, he had... <laughs> He had guns. We're in Texas. Everybody has guns. So he's he's trying to, you know, find this thing and and, uh, shoot it. Well, before he had a chance to do that, this particular alien shot a blue beam out of a breastplate or something in its chest. He said it was about four inches in diameter. And this it was like a laser beam, 
a death beam or whatever, and it cut through everything in the hangar, uh -huh. planes, scaffolding, and it cut a hole through the uh, outside wall of the hangars. Uh -huh. And we're talking corrugated steel. And so now he knew that these things either just could kill him or wanted to kill him. So now he was really scared. So he had guns everywhere. He had guns on his workbench and he had guns on his hip. And, you know, he was he was scared to death. But at the same time, he was fascinated. He wanted to know these creatures. He wanted to know what they knew. So there was this kind of a love hate thing going on through the whole thing. So that was the that was the first one. Well, I, I gotta ask this. I gotta ask this question yes. again, real quick. We've got airplanes now that are damaged by this blue beam. Right, right. He's got to answer to somebody on that. Once again, do any pictures, evidence, uh, insurance claims for the damage, anything? No, he covered it up because he he was see if you're in the aircraft, if you're a pilot or any anywhere in the uh, you know that business, you answer to the FAA. You don't talk about UFOs. In fact, he denied it for a long time and his employees kind of got mad because he wasn't saying anything and they're thinking, you know, am I losing my mind? Uh, and finally it all came out and everybody said, what happens here stays here, but we're not going to tell the, the FAA. So in order to file a claim, they would have had the risk of losing their license to do their business. Yeah. Okay. Um, so he just he just ate the cost and did the repairs himself. Okay. Yeah. So what what happened after that? So then there was another alien that showed up and there were a couple of employees who were there. This was apparently during the daytime and now he's really trigger happy. He's nervous, he's scared and he just reflexively shot this thing and it falls on the the floor of the hangar and it starts bleeding out this blue stuff and outgassing something. And they're, you know, they're kind of coughing and choking. So he says, everybody get out. So they left the hangar. And when they came back, the thing was gone, but there was, he said there was a rivulet etched into the concrete where the thing had bled. And he thought, okay, I'm, I'm glad because hopefully the alien paramedics came and picked him up and, you know, he wasn't dead. He was okay. You know, I didn't really want to hurt him, that kind of thing. But uh, it left, it left a helmet and he said it was like a, it wasn't like a motorcycle helmet or a NASA helmet. It was like a skull cap. You wouldn't have known that it had it on even. So I don't know why it would have, I don't know why, <laughs> you know, why wouldn't the paramedics take the, you know, take everything. everything. Well, so other, uh, but other people in the shop saw this event, obviously, correct? Yes. Yes. According, Has anybody, according to claim. Do we know where these people are at now? Well, uh, we have one of our, we have an investigator on our team and okay. I talked to you about him earlier. Uh, he's trying to, we, we did track down the one guy that saw some things and thinks that it was demonic. Um, but we're still trying to track down some of the people who saw aliens or craft and those okay. kinds of things. So you said you have a police, a uh, former police officer on your team. Well, he, yeah, he's a military um, investigator, former air marshal. Okay. I mean, he any he, now he's a private gotcha. okay. investigator who does poly uh, polygraph and all kinds of things. So, uh, yeah, he's our lead investigator. So uh, finally, there was this to to go back to what Jimmy told me at the beginning. Now there's a third alien who shows up. And he's there all by himself and he shoots it and it falls and it's dead. And he said, you know, I looked at this thing and I'm thinking, if you had told me five years ago that I'd have an alien body and I wouldn't just put it in the back of my truck and drive it all over the country, go on the Oprah show and CNN and everything I could think of, I would have said you were crazy. But he said, in that moment, I felt like, this was a creature. This was a creature of God. Um, this was somebody I, yeah, I was scared of, but I was also interested in knowing what they know. I, you know, one night he packed a bag and sat out on the runway 
hoping that they'd come pick him up and take him for a ride. <laughs> you know, never did though. They ne he never he never got abducted, correct? No. That well, we he said he wasn't, but some of his stories had all the hall hallmarks of abductions. All right. Well, we're about ready to take our last break. So when we get back, we've now got an alien. The alien paramedics did not come and pick this one up. I want to hear what happened to him after that. So folks, stay with us. Still more to come. We'll be back after these messages. I filmed 16 minutes on March 5th, 1994, 16 minutes of broad daylight UFO activity. The other side, the spirit realm, is a parallel dimension which runs, uh, uh, which coexists with ours. And what spirits are doing is they're sending waves of frequency from that dimension to ours. Uh, the government instituted the truth embargo. The government poured disinformation and misinformation into this field, encouraging hoaxes and any other foolishness. It created a truth vacuum that naturally was going to be filled with theories and, and assertions and other stuff. Uh, the oil oligarchs mm -hmm. and the banks and the, and the people who are making decisions that are leading us down the wrong path. They've undermined the research, intimidated and threatened witnesses. Uh, the government is responsible for the fact that the, uh, the status of this issue is not resolved. I'm Rob McConnell, host and executive producer of the X-Zone radio show. Now we are set to bring the amazing world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology to broadcast TV and online video with the development of X-Zone TV. X-Zone TV will now bring our loyal listeners and new viewers face to face with the most controversial and well-known personalities in the field of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. From scientists to theorists, astronauts to adventurers, celebrities, pundits, advocates, and naysayers, they'll all join our rapid fire TV broadcast, interactive discussion, and debate. Interest in the paranormal and parapsychology has never been more intense, and it continues to grow. The truth is out there, so take a deep breath and join us as we step into the light. For more information about Exxon TV, please contact me, Rob McConnell, directly at these coordinates, Rob McConnell at exxonetv.com. with my guest tonight, Pat O'Connell. But before we get going, I just want to remind everybody, if you'd like to check out a little bit more about the uh, Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation and Indian River Hauntings, check out our website at indianriverhauntings.com. Uh, you can also check out our website, our uh, YouTube, I'll get it out, at Indian River, County, uh, Indian River Hauntings 2341. I can't talk tonight. But another thing you can do is if you want to get a hold of me directly here on the show, uh, email me at ghostguy at paranormalstakeout.org. If you've got questions, thoughts, or comments you'd like to make about the show, I'll bring them up at the beginning. Uh, just send me a note. Let's say hello, if nothing else, and ask some great questions. Also, if you want to see some other great uh, programming, go to xzbn.net. That's the X Zone Radio Broadcast uh, Radio and Television Broadcast Network. Great shows there. That's xzbn.net. So please check out that. And Pat, how can folks find out more about you and your work? Uh, can you hear me? Well, they can go to my brother's website, which I, I can. Uh, there's there we've got a delay, apparently. Okay. Uh, 
So they can go to experiencers.com, X with, with just an X at the beginning, experiencers.com. And uh, I've got uh, a video uh, of the book, uh, a little book trailer video and places you can find the book. Uh, we've got it out on ebook and paperback now, and we're working on the uh, audio book should be out in uh, January, hopefully. So, um, okay. What's the name of your yeah. book? So folks can also find that. It's called bleed through a true story of aliens, demons, and pure evil in Texas. Okay. So do check that so out. The folks. best, now, the best way to find it is to go to the website and click the link, because I've found that if you, if you try to, uh, search on the title, it, tries to give you coloring books that don't bleed through or <laughs> something. Well, we've, got, we've got a little bit of a delay here, so we'll try and work yeah. through that. But um, what I also, before we start getting into what happened with the last alien that Clay shot, I, I got to ask one quick question. You made a jump earlier from aliens and demonic possession. Briefly, can you explain to me how you guys made that transition? Or what made you think aliens and demons might be the same? Just briefly. Well, I I was open to whatever. Clay was the one that had the interpretation that um, what was happening to his wife was demonic possession because he said she went from this very sweet personality to this very dark personality, you know, uh, to the point where she was, you know, out there trying to shoot them. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, but where that that concept kind of solidified was when I interviewed one of the witnesses to some of the events out there. Uh, he believed that it was all uh, demonic. Now, Clay saw one night uh, what he thought was an angelic creature, and an, he called it a plasma angel. So it was this blue light sort of undulating in his living room, and it and it. He said it. He said it looked like an angel to him except that it had brown hair and he thought well, wait a minute who says angels have to have blonde hair so it was another one of those weird little cool things that um you know that he came up with that uh but he said that during the course of this uh phenomenon appearing in his living room he said there was this darker energy force that came up from the ground which you know, he, the building was on a slab, so there's nothing underneath. And he said it came up and it seemed to overtake or seduce or attack this blue creature that he saw as an angel. And he felt like that was a demon that was a demon or devil or whatever coming up. And he also said that one night he was, he was taking pictures of what he called an interdimensional portal. And when that thing closed, he still had the camera up, so he started looking through the lens of the camera before he pulled it down to bring it inside. And he said he saw what he said looked like the devil. It was red and slick and slimy, and it was pushing itself out of the ground with its hoofs Interesting. on the ground. And he said it scared him to death, so he, you know, he grabbed the yeah. So well, those, you, you, that's you kind said of he the had a source of the demonic thing. But as I said, so, so it sounds like that they're not, it's not necessarily their theory that they're connected. They're associating behaviors and what they've seen and making an assumption. Now you mentioned he had a camera out. Did he get any pictures of anything when he had the camera out? He got pictures of what he said is, was a, an interdimensional portal. I can't tell you it wasn't. I didn't see what he said came out of it. He said there were ships, there were creatures, there were aliens, there was a, a wolf that walked on its hind legs, came out of it. Um, he didn't get any pictures of that. All I can see is a flare of light. And of course, again, being the skeptic, the analyst, I'm looking at, okay, are there lights on out on the airfield that uh, are um, motion sensor that they would trip that a movement would turn them on. Are there yeah. lights that come on at certain times? And he said, no, I, uh, yes. I mean, there, 
the lights come on at dark and they stay on until dawn. So if that was, if that were uh, just a case of overexposure of normal lights that kind of burned out the, the image, he would have been able to get that every night, all night long. But he said it only happened for an hour. So I can't, okay. that's one of those things. I can't explain that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, getting back to other things that uh, just fantastic stories here. Talk about the alien he shot and what, what happened, this last alien that he shot. Yeah. So, so he's, he's got this alien, he wrapped it. He, he said, I need, I need to buy time. I don't know what to do. So he wrapped it up in black plastic and then put it in a box. And he said, you know, if I keep it, it's, it's going to decompose. I can't just, I can't do that. So he takes it to his cousin's, his cousin had a restaurant that had a walk-in freezer and he took it up and like told, his, told his cousin that he had shot this feral pig. Cause in Texas we have pigs all over the place. So oh, anybody, anybody who wants to, <laughs> who wants to kill one is welcome to. Uh, so he, 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 that's what he told his cousin. And he said, um, you know, just hang on to it for a while. And, and so he kept it in the freezer there for a while. And then he realized that he felt like a murderer. He felt really bad about having killed this creature that he wanted to know. Now, yes, they had threatened him. And I even said, you know, if it was a bear in your house, you would have shot it. And he said, I'm not sure, you know? So I'm thinking this, this guy was a really tender hearted guy, despite all the guns and the macho, mm -hmm. he was very tender hearted. And, and he, felt like he had done wrong to this alien. So he finally goes out to the, gets, gets his, gets the body back from, from the freezer. Cousin never knew what it was. Um, and he brings it back and he buries it and he performs a little, you know, some kind of a little ceremony over it to feel, to, feeling like he wanted to, to pay his respects to this creature. Do you know where that body was buried? I know where he claims that it was buried. I have directions. Have you had an opportunity to go there yet and see approximate if it actually directions exists? to it? Yes. Okay. So, so you've been out there? Not yet, um, because yes, um, and and we I've assembled a team now to go out there and and look for it. But the the kicker is that at one point when we were interviewing, when my husband and I were out at the airport and we interviewed clay he told my husband i might have booby trapped it now my husband said oh okay if right you now. did what what would you have used he said hand grenades so knowing that he yes he had he he had a, a license to manufacture weapons so he had uh he had special licenses from the uh ATF for mm -hmm. handling things that normal people wouldn't. So it would not surprise me if he was, he had the ability to have hand grenades. Now, some of the people on my team, including we have a, a, a former military uh, bomb tech, he thinks it wouldn't be a military issue hand grenade. It would, be, would have been a dummy that Clay then packed himself. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. So, Interesting. so we have, Is, we've had to look at it in terms of, um, first of all, we don't want anybody to know where this is because we don't want people going out there and just digging holes and blowing themselves up. So I trust though, when you find out, you will share that. Oh, absolutely. We'll share it with the world for sure. Right. Well, we've, we've only got about two minutes left now. Wrap the story up. What happened to Clay? Well, so the minutes. first thing that happened, my brother was going to come out to Texas and film mm -hmm. and interview and and dig up the body. Uh, and shortly before he came here, I got the call in the middle of the night that he had passed away in his sleep. He had a heart attack. So, sorry. so then um, Clay and I were kind of lost 
we continued to correspond. We continued to talk, um, but we were both kind of gut punched and didn't know what to do. And so about a year after he died, I, uh, I made a video, a memorial video for my brother and I sent it out and uh, I sent it out to everybody who would have known him, people on social media. And I obviously sent it out to people like Clay and I didn't hear back and didn't hear back. So I contacted uh, Clay's sister because I thought this is unusual. I was, I had been talking to Clay or emailing him several times a week, if not several times a day. Uh, and so it was really odd that I didn't hear from him about this because he and Jim had become very close. And <clears throat> so I contacted his sister and I said, is he okay? And she said, no, he's in the hospital. He has multiple organ failure and flesh eating bacteria. And if he survives, they're going to have to cut off huge portions of his skin and do transplants on it. And then the next day she said he had passed away. So. Yeah, because, well, I'm fascinated with your investigation. I really think testing water and soil out there is going to be really important to you. It's either going to give you answers or give you more questions. Either way, it's going to be very, very helpful. And we're anxious to hear what you find out about that. So yeah. um, uh, I, I keep going, move forward as, as it were. And, and we're just about done for the night. I'm hoping to have you back to hear what you find. I would love to. Continue. And we'll talk more about it. And folks, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. We've heard a fascinating story. Always keep your mind open as well as your eyes. Take good care of yourselves. Love your family. Have a happy happy holidays, and we'll see all of you on the other side. Have a good night, folks.